Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the SEER screenwriting panel. Um, we're really lucky to have Lauren Paul Kaplan with us. Um, Lauren has done so many things. He's a, he's a screenwriter, he's a director, he's a playwright, he's a composer. Um, he teaches screenwriting at some places you might have heard of, like Columbia University, the New School, Hofstra. Um, he's also a script consultant. He's got a sign-up sheet over there if you want to be on his ma mailing list, email list. You can uh, put your email address over there. Um, and he's done such interesting work, you know, uh, he's written film scripts for studios like Paramount, Columbia, Orion, TriStar. He's also made indie films. He's had poetry produced and uh, published in the Paris Review. Um, he's had plays produced. Um, just if there's anything you can do creatively, I think Lawrence, he has an album, at least one, right? Of music, yeah? So uh, just a really talented guy and, and again, a great teacher. Uh, great and really, I don't think I've ever spoken to anyone who has an understanding of storytelling like he does. So let's welcome Lauren Paul Kaplan today. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I see. I assume we have people in the audience who are writers and interested in, whoa, in the craft of screenwriting. Am I right about that? So um, I want to tell a quick story of something that happened and I want to get Lauren's take on it. So about a year ago, um, I got a very angry email from somebody um, who is convinced that he has, he's written, he says, between 10 and 15 scripts, and he is convinced that he has genius. Um, but the only reason he's not working is because there are barriers to entry, that the gatekeepers will not look at his stuff. And if they would only look at his stuff, they would see that he's a genius, and that his stuff could get produced. So, Lauren, you work with a lot of students. What would your advice be to this fellow if he was here today? Wow. Um, so I, I get versions of that a lot, and I feel it myself. I mean, barriers. There's barriers. There's people out there guarding guarding the uh, the green light. There's tons of them. And uh, there are barriers. And one could probably say that throughout history, there's a lot of genius that goes undiscovered. Um, typically, though, and, no, and it's, it's really hard. This business, screenwriting, has two components, unfortunately. One is creating a great product, and the second one is selling a great product. And it's, it's kind of sad that the second part oftentimes requires so much um, intelligence and diligence and all that stuff. And for all of us, for everyone. I mean, I have friends who have, you know, written that great, great scripts, and five years later, they can't get arrested. It, it, it's really, really, it's kind of a relentless business. And, you know, people call it the film business because it's, they don't call it the film culture. They call it the film business. It's a business. And so people who are going to put money out, like you guys are independent movies, you're putting money out. It's real money. It's hard money. And so when you talk in the multi-millions, when you consider that, gosh, in my lifetime, in our lifetime, most of all the studios have been bought by giant conglomerates. And these studios are like this arms or fingers of gigantic conglomerates. And they're looking at screenplays as hardcore monetary you know, products and units and people. It's all monetized. And that's scary, especially if you have a love for cinema and you want to make something and just see something good. So what would I tell that guy? I would say, you got to keep sending stuff out. And you have to send stuff to the festivals these days. These days, one of the entry places for uh, new screenwriters to be noticed are, you know, there's tons of, like here, and there's about five or six kind of high profile <clears throat> festivals in the country that if you get in the semifinals <clears throat> or quarterfinals especially, that agents will take note. At the Nichols, you guys might have heard of the Nichols Festival, I don't know, Nichols Screenwriting Foundation or why I forget. It's a fellowship, right? It's a fellowship. They, they call it a fellowship. There's an award, there's money. It's, it's the Academy of the, Acad the, the Academy of the Academy Awards puts it together. But when you, uh, I can't even apply to it, but I co-wrote something with somebody who did apply. I can't apply to it because if you've sold something, you're, you're not legally to apply. 
but I did it with somebody who didn't realize that he sent it in for himself and my name was on it, but it got to semifinals or something like that. And he was getting you know, literally agents and managers for emailing him, basing being based on quarterfinals or some you know, not a lot, you know, of the Nichols Festival. So the 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 there's a few of these festivals which are way in. So that's one thing. Secondly, you know, what are the what is the content and the intent of these screenplays that this genius has, has written? And um, what I'm saying is like, you know, I saw a movie The Lobster last night. Let's see some nods. You know, that's it's a cool movie, fun movie. Fun is not exactly the word for it, but it's an interesting movie. Um, you can't write that movie and expect to get arrested in America. And I say arrested, you know what I'm saying, meaning someone's going to give you some money for it and do something for it. That's a movie that's an auteur movie. You make, you write this bizarre film and you make this bizarre film. Um, and then you find a place in maybe world cinema. So world cinema is another, another outlet for this whole world. So this genius who has his six scripts that are genius, are they genius um, for his bubble? Hey. Hi, my friend. Uh, 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 are, they, are they genius within the bubble reality of him and his friends? Or what is the marketplace for this genius? So I, I know I'm going on and on. I don't know. I hope I'm kind of addressing this thing. But it's really hard. And like typically, so, I, you know, I'm on a lot of mailing lists and a lot of screenwriting gurus, quotes, contact me and all like that. I mean, not me necessarily personally, but sometimes. And one of them recently wrote, there are two kinds of screenplays. And I, I was rolling my eyes about that. Whenever I see this kind of must be in binary things, it makes me crazy. Two kinds, you've, you've seen those books, write a hit screenplay in 30 days. You know, I mean, I know these people who write these things. Again, they really should be, should be arrested. But in any case, um, so this one said, there are two kinds of screenplays. There are ones that people read and want to buy on the spot or option on the spot, and the second ones, he said, are a waste of trees. <laughs> I disagree with that. I don't think things are binary. I think there's a spectrum. And we all will see movies up there and go, I could have written that. I, I could write that good. My idea is that good. My screenplay is that good. And yes, there's relationships and contacts that are a part of that. You'll find that behind most movies, especially Hollywood movies, but some of the big independent movies as well. There's a story, and the person just didn't wake up one day and just send it in and get it made. There's a story. They've been hanging out for years, and they know people and relationships. I mean, I'm, I'm involved in something right now with a former student of mine from Columbia 17 years ago that has a movie called Goat about to come out in the theaters. No, but you will hear it. This could be a big movie. And so... He, he's involved with me on a project, but the truth is, I'm, I'm on his coattails. He's not on my coattails. He's the hot guy. I'm, I'm, I'm coming around, coming along on his ride. And that's another component with these genius screenplays. To find a director or a, what's called an element in this business, a producer, director, a writer, less a writer. It's an actor. It's an element, something that will bring currency to the project. And so we, there's other ways in producers, other ways in studios, other ways in financiers. Get it to an actor who means something. So how do you get it to the actor? You gotta get it to their management. You gotta get to their management. I don't know. You have to find out whether they take solicited or unsolicited work. So there's a former publicist. Story. We heard on the previous panel. Yeah. So, or, or so a former it. publicist gave it to the actress and she signed up. That's another way to get it as well. Any way you can. So to your genius Friend, I sympathize. Not my friend. Not my friend. <laughs> <laughs> to the to the geniuses of us all out there, um, uh, I, I sympathize with you, and you just gotta uh, go into it heart and soul, and try to create relationships, and try to create contacts, and don't stop. And at the, the, at the final line, I'm hoping that there's some value in the writing itself. Mm -hmm. I hope that that alone can bring some kind of. Uh, meaning to your life really so he should be he should feel as if if he produces good work that it will be discovered um, he should realize that it better be good work to be even considered <laughs> it, it has to be and you know what is good work 
What does that mean? Well, what is good work? So, so I've defined good work a couple ways. In my classes, I say, does it work? You know, you've all heard stories from people and you go, that doesn't work. So how do we define what does work and what are the levels? So in my mind, I've defined it a couple ways. The first level is I can understand it. I don't say I like it. I understand it. I could follow the progression. Um, the second way, the second level would be that I understand the progression and I'm kind of enjoying it. Kind of. And the third way is I'm compelled to it. And I think you want your thing to be compelling. So that's what I'm defining as working. And it also means what niche you're in. But you know, when you talk about these sort of niche audiences, and it's kind of hard to say, oh, well, you really have to be, you know, a kid to like this thing. But you know, the Pixar hits a home run every time, a grand slam every time, and kids and adults like it. And they are a mix of people like this in a room, sitting around a table. But they sit around this table for a couple of years working on the outline before they even write the darn thing. And they just try to get all the beats really in the right order to tell the right story. So, yeah, what does it work? I, I'm hoping working, what I said, sort of resonates with you because we all know when things don't work. So, we've been talking very generally. I always like to make sure that we try and move to some more specifics so that people don't walk out feeling like woozy. Um, <laughs> and so one thing is, being a teacher for so long, you've seen a lot of work, right? So. What do you see your students do year after year after year that they could do better or they could fix that would be good advice for everyone out there not to fall into the same traps as your students? Revise, revise, revise. People, and I, you know, especially when I began, sort of started this, you're sort of so high when you finish something, you just kind of go, whoa. It's just hard to re look at it over and over, get feedback, get other people's points of view. Take a look, you know, we're, it's such a, a solitary endeavor, even if you're writing with a partner. It's hermetically sealed, and you need to get it out in the open and seeing if other people are seeing what you're seeing. And if they're not, it's okay, too, if they're seeing something that's working. Again, working defined the way I said. If it has resonance, if it's working for them. So I guess that's the number one thing, is people are careless, and, and they don't do the hard work of revising and really looking to work over. So before I let you go on to the next sure. one, how can people better revise their work? Because I, I teach writing as well as you know, but more I teach journalism, and um, some people don't know how to revise their own work. That's uh, well put. How, how can people better revise their work? Well, because so this is a craft. Screenwriting is a craft. So I would hope that initially people would try to understand the craft. And there are people who just sort of jump into it. They say, I've seen a bunch of movies, and we always hear about that story of someone who did that, that version of things, and it worked, and they had a big success. But that's an anomaly. It's really rare. It's a craft. So when you build a table, you build it, and there's sort of equal distance between the end, and there's dimensions, and we work it out. It's like it, it's a craft of building a table. And similarly, when you build a screenplay, it's beginning, middle, and end the same way. And we have to, we have to transfer, transpire that, that distance, that distance in time. And so there's pillars and there's things you could learn how to do. They're just pure craft. Structure is a huge, huge aid to understanding your story, where your story is. You might have gotten notes from people saying, oh, I like it, I like it towards the end, or I like different parts, or you didn't, didn't discover where the story is. I could give you a premise, but the, the premise is really kind of maybe a good premise, but where the story is depends on the execution of the premise. So understanding craft, number one, would be a good way before. But assuming you have a bit of craft and now you need to revise, then you need to get other eyes on this stuff because it's hard to revise on your own. On the other hand, before, when, when students send, give stuff to me, they just have not looked it over. And it's reckless and it's the, they have not done the basic the basic basics in terms of like capitalizations and the, I can't tell you if you want to turn off professional readers mess up with the format and the format is so easy because you can get it free on, on uh, uh, what's it called um, what's the download uh, Celtex C-E-L-T-X dot com is a free is a free screenwriting software um, but I mean you can get anything if the format's pretty available and people still neglect typos and all this kind of stuff. 
And readers understand who are the first line of defense for keeping, keeping every, the guards. They are looking for excuses not to read this stuff. So give them an excuse and they will say, great, thanks. Real easy. So does that begin to answer? Oh, yeah, that definitely begins. But let me ask you, I want to follow up on something you said. I, was, I want to yeah. let you finish them. So you said get people to read it. Who should read it? So should you, should... Yeah, yeah. so this is good. For, you know, who should not read it, although even they, at the last resort, are fine, are your friends and family. <laughs> because they love you and they are thrilled to read a screenplay because they never have before. And by the way, if there's no one else, it's a great place to start. And why not? You know, come on. I, I, but then you want to widen it out to people, ideally, who have read screenplays before and understands the demands of the medium. But, you know, again, uh, you just want to get somebody else. I'm, I'm really not against friends and family reading the thing. Just understand, you have to give permission to your friends and family to be really critical. And when I tell people stuff, I, I already, it's tough for me because, like, I have friends who are former students or whatever, and I go, come on, forget the mentor relationship. I need to get some hard re Someone's going to be cruel out there in the world. I, I, let's start hearing it now. And um, if they, I mean, not to be cruel, to be cruel sake, but really tell me where it's not working for you. What's, what's, what's not going on? So is, that's the start of, of who to get into reading to. But ideally, I mean, there's a lot of people, people, listen, a dear friend of mine who's a pretty big novelist, he always pays to get editors to, to these are novels, to read his novels. He pays kind of real money with the notion that that's the only way he's going to get real if it's a business relationship, so I'm not suggesting you all put real money to have someone read it, but there are there are services and people you want to get some 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 distance on on your stuff. Also, the thing that I ask is I do consultations as well. I always say before there's a consultation, I ask you I ask the the, the person who wants a consultation is what is the intent of your script? That's the like what do you want to do with this thing? One says, well, I want to I want to send it in and have Tom Cruise be in it. That's that's a script. Typically, it's called a spec script. So on, you write it on speculation or to sell it for uh, maybe a lot of money. There's another kind of script too. Well, I want to make it myself. Okay. So do you want to make it yourself? And you have the money in your pocket. That's one kind of script. You, you don't have to listen to me. What do you want to happen from it? Well, I want it to go to Sundance. Oh, that's pretty specific. Sundance Festival is pretty specific, the kinds of movies they like. Is it a Sundance script? They typically don't like the action types of movies. They like a particular kind of thing. So you have to gear sometimes your target market of who is going to read it and why they're going to read it. So I always ask, them, what is the intent? What is your purpose? What do you want to, I say, you know, what do you want to come, what do you want to get from this, from this uh, consultation with me? So I, wanna, I want the person to know when they go into it, what, what is the ideal outcome? Uh, I've had people in my, I have a work, uh, not in my school, but I have a private workshop. And, and you guys, if you sign up, I'll, I'll, you'll get on the mailing list for that. I'll, you'll know what it is. But I, I've had people go from my workshop to other workshops around, and they'll never change anything. They're just kind of trying to find someone to eventually like it. <laughs> and we all, we all understand that syndrome. So it's, just, it's, it's another approach, but I'm recommending that you be open and get your ears wide and understand the real purpose and intent of why you're writing it and what you want to get from it. That's good advice. Um, I, I wanted to touch on one more thing before I open the floor for, for questions, and that is, I feel like there's been so many changes in the industry. I mean, the industry is always changing, but from the time, you know, 15 years ago when my film opened up this festival, um, <laughs> Deb, do you believe it's been 15 years since? <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, I feel like it's not even the same industry anymore. And at that point, it had changed so much from the 10 years before that, you know. Um, so, what, I mean, what opportunities do you think are available to writers now that weren't, and what opportunities do you think are more closed down than they had been? Um, well, in terms of being a professional writer, and a lot of times in film festivals and in, and in smaller film festivals, that's not necessarily the intent. The intent is to make an independent film. But there are many more venues than there ever was. I mean, there are 300 new television shows. Each one of those shows have writer's rooms, between five and 12 writers or more. So do the math. They're looking for writers. They're looking to fill those rooms up. 
It's a commitment. There are very few of them in New York. Most of them in Los Angeles, the writers' rooms. Most of the shows you see, even though they're shot in New York, they're not, the writers' rooms are not in New York because of all kinds of union reasons and blah, blah, blah. Tax benefits primarily. Um, so in terms of the business changing, there's been a real move to television in terms of where narratives are. And good work is too. Yes, I'm sure I've seen some great shows. I have. This is terrific work out there. Um, in terms of independent film, uh, that's kind of a slightly different market. And, you know, what is the purpose of the screenplay? See, again, I'm re referencing the movie I saw last night, The Lobster. It's a really wild film. And it's so wild that, that you know, Hollywood wouldn't pay attention to that screenplay in a second. It, the, the, sec the second lead, Rachel Weiss, doesn't enter the movie till 60 minutes into it. You know, those are kind of general things that you can't do when you're writing for Hollywood because it's hard to get that actor. Why did she, why, why did Rachel Weisz enter that movie? Well, that filmmaker, his previous film out of Greece, a Greek filmmaker, got had a real famous film that, you know, became a real cause celeb within the whole international film world. That's the world film world. Now, we have this called the Long Island International Film Festival, and the international films have kind of a different marketplace and a different perception and a different mindset than the Hollywood movies. My agent, when I got back with him recently at Paradigm, said, you know, Laura, I'm no longer doing film. He says the film business is he says the film business for him as an agent is dead. Well, that was kind of a big deal because I had just been writing films mostly and been writing TV yet, which I'm doing a lot now. And so he's a little exaggerating the thing. What did he mean by that? Well he meant that in Hollywood where when I started maybe if there were a hundred assignments Maybe there would be 80 writers, but now if there's 50 assignments, there's five writers doing the same ones over and over again. It's hard for those assignments in Hollywood. And the so-called independent movies are $25 million movies that are just not made in the studio and now called independent. So for the lower budget movies, they can't, an agent can't make any money, or a manager can't make any money. And most independent movies don't make any money. Blood Simple, the Coen Brothers first movie, you know, grossed $5 million. That's a gross, but for them, who knows what it was. The point is that agents are looking for, they're looking to pay the rent. They're looking to make a mortgage, just like everybody else is. So when you want to get a manager and agent, and you have a great project, because it's very indie, they have to say, is it indie as a stepping stone for you to make more money? And that's not always what we all want to do. A lot of us like small, kind of wonderful, independent movies, and we just want to do that. So then you have to realize you might have to do most of the work yourself. You're not going to get people to help because they're not going to make any money on it unless they find some other remuneration. Did I go too far off point here? Yeah. Anyhow. Uh, Has the role of the agent and manager changed since the last 10, 15 years? Yes, well, for managers are much more important than they ever were. So, in case you don't know, to be an agent, especially kind of a regular agent, in a legitimate agency, that is a fiduciary responsibility, so they have to actually be like a real estate agent. It's a fiduciary responsibility. Real estate agents have to pay, take a test and they have to be worked under uh, a license. So agents are the same way and they can negotiate your deals, but they cannot be a part of the production. So many agents have left to become managers and managers now oftentimes are producers as well. So you'll find a lot of agents have left. There's about a huge consolidation of the agencies. There used to be many boutique agencies. Now that's way less and there's some major agencies with a lot of clients and what they primarily do other than take 10% is pa try to package. It's, it's kind of a clusterfuck, excuse me, out there. And, and managers are more important for television than for film and managers are opening up a lot of doors. So it's another way to, it's another person to send stuff to, trying to find a manager. Some of managers will handle that talent, meaning actors as well as directors and writers. So yeah, it has, it has changed. Well, I want to leave plenty of time for questions because I assume people have questions, so I'm going to open up the floor and have a question. Hi, uh, you were talking about agents. Yes. Um, I have a, a script and a, a short film, and I sent it to um, a screener, I guess it's called, for one of the largest, most prominent directors in the world, and they said that they really want to pass it along to him. They think he would love it. 
but I don't have an agent. They won't touch anything that doesn't come for an agent. How do you get it? Yeah, so, first of all, who, it? so this is a short film? It's a short film, and there is a feature length script. And you sent it initially to who? To, uh, I guess it's called his, his screener or view the. the for, a, for a director, you say? Yes. Yeah. Uh, is this, but it, it's, it's a professional screener who represents directors? I don't understand what no, this is. He, he, he works with him. Oh, so Steven Spielberg's, yeah. um, his Marvin Levy works with Steven. So this person said, it'd be great for Steven, but you can't. You got to send it by way of an agent only. Yeah, is that right? Right, through um, Amblin Films that won't look at anything that's right, unsolicited. Agent, so that's a, that's a problem. So yeah. uh, so there's, there's typically a couple of ways. A, a reputable manager will be able to send it to them. A reputable lawyer, when I say a reputable lawyer, I don't mean a good or a known lawyer, but a lawyer is known within the industry, and there's a number of law firms which work that way, can get past those gates. And, and of course, an agent. This is, sorry, we can turn this off. I know, it's so embarrassing. So embarrassing. Can we turn it off as well? Oh, it's Hollywood calling. A million dollars. So sorry, guys. Um, yeah, so it, it, it is difficult to get stuff read. Again, it's through the managers and lawyers and agents to get it through. And the other way is sometimes unsolicited places will say, you know, we'll accept it if you sign a, you know, a waiver that you're giving, so that if you, every movie gets sued, especially every Hollywood movie gets sued. I, I, I got a story by credit, I wrote an initial script, and the movie lost eighteen million dollars. They tried to sue us. I mean, there's no money. Every movie gets sued, and the big successful movies get sued multiple times. So everyone's trying to protect themselves. So but how you do know, you go about getting an agent? Well, that you, I would recommend going trying to get a manager first, and or there are some agents. But if you, there's a lot of agent guidebooks or online. And you have to send and find out which ones will accept, either solicited or unsolicited. And you have to be able to write a query letter to them. Do you accept it? And you have to be able to hype yourself in a paragraph, not much more, you know, so that you can get them involved in you. I would suggest the Writers more. Guild has a list of um, agents that they're that are certified by the Writers Guild to be literary agents. They don't write back though. They don't. But if you say the story that you're telling me, you might get a response because some accept, most don't accept, you know, queries. The thing I would also say is, the more you network, when I was more actively making films, there was an agent that I met through my networking, and she and I just developed a relationship where when I ran into barriers like that, which happened a lot, I would just call her up and say, I need you to submit this, she would do it for me, I, this person wants to me to write something, here's the contract, can you look it over? She would represent me and do the negotiation, but she didn't list me in her clients, and I didn't and I didn't put on my website, I'm represented by so-and-so. We just had a relationship that when projects came up where I needed an agent, she would do it, and if there was money, she would take a cut, and if there wasn't, she just did it because we had a relationship. And it's not the kind of thing that I got through a query letter, it's just through networking and meeting people and talking to people and things like that. And another thing regarding that, um, does it, has a short film played, played festivals? Uh, we just wrapped in January. We've been in two festivals so far and we've won three awards. Well, good. I mean, that helps. You know, those type of things help, depending especially where they are and what, and when you write query letters to people, you say, this short one is this thing, and we have a script with it, and if you could define it, you know, the, 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 lug, the slug lines and how you define these things, you know, really quickly to, to make them interesting is a big deal. So get spend some time on the descriptions of what these projects are, so you could pitch it really easily, even on paper. But it's really hard, and you know, you just have to, as as Mitch said, you know, you got to network and try to find it. But a manager is just as good as an agent; they they can submit to these places. So that's another whole realm of places to consider. And again, the big industry of lawyers too. Yeah, that's one that people sometimes don't realize is the lawyers, yeah. and uh, I know several people through the years who went that route as well, and I actually make use of that sometimes as well. Yeah, absolutely. You submit your work through a lawyer? Mm -hmm. oh, wow. So it, uh, it has to be an industry lawyer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, when I was more actively making films, I had a lawyer that I worked with, and there were times where I needed to submit, and I would call him and I'd say, can you submit for me? And he said, sure, and yeah.
because he worked in the industry and people knew him. Our newest, our newest company, yeah. Yeah, well, he was a solo guy. So yeah, they knew him. Yeah. Other questions? Usually, it's all questions. I know you guys usually have tons of questions. Well, well, if you don't have questions, uh, we could uh, make something up. <laughs> but you can say, you can say. Yeah. There you go. Um, what advice do you have to first-time screenwriters in terms of shaping a story, shaping a script, shaping dialogue? Um, just those who are just beginning. What are the basics like? Well, basic that, so that's just gonna. And that's a great question. But can I can I just I fine tune it a little bit to make him give a better answer? Sure. So basically, I, I think what you're saying is someone has an idea. You started earlier. It's like there's a premise, but that's not a script, right? What is the process to go about turning a premise into a script. Did I, is that okay? Yes. Okay. Well, that's a that's a screenwriting one. I would take some screenwriting one classes, intro classes, and maybe you've done that already, so you go past that. I know at some of the schools I'm, I teach at, I actually, there's a at new school, there's something called the Screenwriting Certificate Program, and I was one of the authors of, the, of that syllabus. You know, we have script analysis before the screenwriting one, so people know how to read a script, and they know how to view a script, and they can identify the, the parts of the script, the turning points, the inciting incidents, the midpoints, all these kind of things that are pretty consistent in the architecture of a screenplay. Building a bridge, how do you build a bridge? I'm sure in architect school, there's ways to build a bridge, and it's pretty consistent. So, you know, learning the basics through script analysis and or from basic screenwriting classes is a good start. There's books about that stuff. I find that it's hard to oftentimes learn the stuff from a book uh, because it's sort of like learning to dance from a book. You kind of have to hear the music. You know, the book says, make two steps to the left, count to three. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to do. You want to hear the music. And classes tend to do that. And getting involved with kind of a workshop that can kind of help make sure that, God, is my idea insane or not? I think a great point about that is understanding structure is probably the first step and it's the most important thing because people think, I want to make a crazy indie film, I don't need to know about structure, but that's not true. Because first of all, most good indie films even do have adhering to a kind of traditional structure of storytelling. And even if they don't, when you break the rules, you have to know how you're breaking the rules. Because film is a language, right? When you show a film to an audience, you're having a conversation with the audience. And when you do certain things, people have seen enough films that there's a pattern, right? So when a screenwriter breaks that pattern, the screenwriter has to know that he or she is doing that to get the effect of the broken pattern, right? A, a great example in film I always give of that is the, there's a, a romantic comedy called My Best Friend's Wedding with Julie Roberts, and there's a, there's a scene where she arrives at the airport for the wedding, and waiting for her is Cameron Diaz. And they shoot Cameron Diaz in this total glamour shot where her blonde hair is, is streaming and the sun is coming down at her in the terminal. And through 50, 60, 70 years of film, we were trained what the director is saying here is, she is the nemesis. She is the person we have to get past. You're not going to like her. She's the bad guy trying to stop Julia Roberts from getting the guy that she wants. And when she arrives and we're waiting for that moment, what does she do? She gives the biggest smile that melts all of our hearts and gives her a big hug. Right? The writer knew what he was doing at that point. He was setting something up in the language of film that we already know, and then he broke the, the rules of structure in a way to get the desired effect that he wanted at that moment. So even if you're not going to write in the traditional three-act, five-part structure with an inciting incident in the first ten pages and all that other stuff, you have to know what you're doing when you don't write in that style. And I think that when I look at screenplays, that's one of the first things I notice is when there's no structure. I read a very interesting idea for a script as part of the, 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 the festival's um, screenplay competition where the pitch was just got me. I thought it was a great pitch, a really innovative pitch. Like I've never seen a movie like this. This could be really compelling. But as you read it, you realize there's no structure. And without a structure, there's no movie, right? And, and understanding the structure is almost like the first step to getting something, because you can't tell the story without it. Did you agree with that? Yeah. Pretty, pr I mean, the exceptions are kind of, you know, Terry Malick movies, you know. That are, he knew what he was doing. Oh, yeah, but he's also Terry Malick, so <laughs> that's the difference. Yeah, but I totally agree with you. Yeah. Does, that, does that answer your question at all? Um, Maybe <coughs> mostly <laughs> when you when you refer to structure, what specifically are you referring to? Like beginning, middle, end, or is this something more complex? Yeah, I mean, like 
there are books, and like Warren said, it's hard from books, but even in a, in, in a, in a class, with this idea that most traditional screenplays have a three-act structure, you know, where there's a first act, it's the first 30 pages, and at the end of the first act, there's going to be a major change that puts the story into it, it, the main conflict, the main character's conflict will be set. Before that, the first part is going to be the inciting incident, which is the action that puts that makes the, the film go, the person getting drafted, the, per, the bank being robbed, whatever is going to start the action. And there's a midpoint climax halfway through the second act, and then there's a, a second act climax where everything, you know, if you, if you read the hero's journey or whatever, that's when everything What's the opposite of what it's going to be. The hero is, you know, dangling from the castle wall, looks like he's going to fall, you know. Yeah. And then the resolution of the, of the hero's journey is the third act climax. And there's a denouement after. And that's, not every movie has that, but I, I had a great screenwriting teacher years ago, and I didn't go to film school. This was kind of a, you know, a continuing education type thing at NYU. And she taught the structure, and the way she got a lot of the more, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I, I like commercial stuff, I don't only like indie stuff, so I, I didn't need to be coaxed. But some people did, and she tricked everyone by making us read the screenplay for The Crying Game, which is not considered a big Hollywood film. If you remember that, that film from the early 90s, it was a, there was a big twist in it that the lead character, who you think is a woman, turns out to be a, a man, a transgender woman. Um, and uh, that follows the Hollywood five-part structure so closely that it, it's like more than Jaws does. You know what I mean? It's like it is a slave to the five-part structure. And it just shows you how even making a really edgy indie movie, which is a wonderful film, but it also is a, a really strong sense of storytelling structure that keeps you interested. And, and if I can only add one thing, if I, so I've heard of five-act structure. I don't know what it is after all these five, years. Five-part structure. Uh, yeah. uh, three-act structure. The three, yeah, the three. I kind of just, at the end of the day, I, I've been doing this so long, at the end of the day, I'm kind of, everyone has different terms for these different things and different definitions for these different things but kind of energetically <laughs> you know we have to we have to get from one place minute one and walk out at 120 minutes later so you're on a drive yeah. keep it interesting <laughs> and you know when you kind of analyze how to keep something interesting you'll find again and again that like at a certain point I need to stretch, I need to rest, I need to, I mean, if you're on the drive, you know, to keep it interesting, it's kind of common sense, but we've sort of codified this common sense and like get me involved in the beginning. Right, I mean, that's a great point, right? So like even if you don't know what an inciting incident is, if I'm on page 25 of the screenplay and I don't know what the movie's about, and I don't know who the lead character is, I don't know what the major conflict is, I don't know what he's trying to overcome or she's trying to overcome, that's a problem. You can call it anything you want. Yeah. You know, we, we kind of want to know where we are and where we're going, even if we don't go there. <laughs> you know? So these are, these are things you could learn and they could, be, they could really be taught. So that's a good, good start. That was really helpful. One last question. Um, so what advice would you give to somebody who's written a bunch of shorts? But wants to write their first feature because it seems like a big undertaking. To, it is, to write. and I and I even question whether writing a lot of shorts prepare you for a feature. I, I, this is sort of a a pedagogical debate. <laughs> you know, there's like, should you take a short class teach before you take a feature class, and, and all that kind of stuff. And I don't necessarily think that shorts add up to features. Um, I mean, shorts in many ways, the award-winning ones these days, are kind of like commercials, really. But on the other hand, you can find a beginning, middle, and end. It's not always 25, 50, 25% as the classic straight act structure. But shorts, so I would say just jump into this thing. And, um, and if you, you know, and if you've made some of these shorts, it might give you some understanding of how long things take. New screenwriters have a really difficult time understanding how long things take. So they will start their movie, and then they will get, things will happen by the middle of the movie that should have happened in the first ten minutes or the first twenty minutes. So would it be worth it to write like an outline for? Hundred percent, not even question, a, a, a thousand percent. And I can always tell screenplays that the person just jumped into it. Mm -hmm. It just feels arbitrary. There are a handful of crazy, talented, like people born with way too much talent that you know we get angry that anyone could have that much talent exactly. kind of thing. They can sit down and write a script, you yeah. know, with a starting just writing scenes. But that's not the way human beings really can function. And I've heard of it, but I don't know. And I know some really, a lot of really famous screenwriters. No one, you, you, you know, 
You you have this thing outlined pretty pretty clear. And I mean, who who did um, who was a great screener? Billy Wilder. I was reading there's a, a biography of his, of his, and he was said that he would work with the, Billy Wilder did something like it hot in a million classic yeah, movies. Of you know, department based on oftentimes plays and books and famous guy. And he was old school European, came to America, would put on a suit and tie and went to work every day at the studio. And he worked with a guy named A.E. Diamond. And I remember reading this one chapter that he worked for six months, this is like eight hour days on the outline before abandoning it. <laughs> so that is just some work, getting these outlines to work out really well. So definitely. I love short films, so I don't want you to think I'm in any way saying bad things about them. The most favorite thing I've ever done in my life was a four-minute short film that played a lot of film festivals before I made my first feature. I just think that what I learned from making it was more at the scene level. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think making that film did anything to prepare me to write the feature. Yeah, because in features you have like so much time. And time. The structure is completely different. You know, with the, with a four-minute short film, you get one. It can be about one thing with one payoff, right? right yeah. And you know, a film you can't go 120 pages on one thing with one payoff, right? That's the whole pacing thing we're talking about. Things have to happen. You have to keep people interested along the way. Mm -hmm. So the structure is so wildly different. I don't think writing a short really prepares you to write a feature mm -hmm. at the macro level, only at the granular level. Mm -hmm. If you've written some shorts, you probably won't be one of those screenwriters who makes the mistake of getting into a scene. Every scene, it seems like about half of a page to. Uh, too too soon and getting out about a half of a page too late, right? Like that's a, a sign of an amateur script. If, you know, why are we listening to all this? We could have started the scene here, and why are we keep going? We could have stopped the scene here. Shorts help you do that at the scene level, right, right, right. but not at the macro level. You, you know, one last thing. Um, we're talking about writing, and outlining feels differently different than sitting writing a screenplay. A lot of people don't like the outlining thing because it doesn't feel like real writing, but it takes. A lot, a lot of effort to put that outline down. You have to conceive it in your head, and people don't want to take that step. And it's an essential step, and it's a long process. But I was just going to say another thing: writing is expressing, and I'm encouraging writers to write, whether they write a journal or articles. I write a column for a magazine, two, two, you know, two columns a month for a magazine. That's what I've been doing recently, and you know, that's been really interesting for me to stay focused on writing. So writing is writing, and I, I recommend, again, I'm really big on writing as a way to create meaning in your life, because I think that if you're trying to do it with the expectation of making a million dollars, or whatever it is, that alone, then that's gonna be possibly a bitter experience. So I'm really trying to encourage people to get benefit out of everything they do. And, there's, and I believe sincerely there's a lot of benefit from, uh, from writing screenplays, just in the writing of himself. Okay, well, thanks so much for coming, and thank you to Lauren for his work. And um, don't forget, he's got his sign up list there if you want to hear from him about his yeah, stuff. Yeah, if you do that, if you, if you do that, then I'll just put you on my mailing list, and I have workshops in three years in the city. Thanks. Thanks. You'll learn how to do stuff, but if you can't,